Yeah. Well, are you making an uh, introduction with us? Or uh, yes. just start right away? <laughs> uh, we will make. Okay, so, that's easier. Yeah. 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 Just give us a cue whenever. Uh, okay. Yeah, whenever you. Um, Asin, uh, Asin, I think we can start, right? You're also fine. Okay, so um, hello everyone and thank you for joining us this afternoon for this very special event with Kengukuma and Associates. Um, today we are hosting the leading partner, Ms. Yuki Ikekuchi and the project manager, Yasemin Shahinar. Uh, they will be presenting their highly admired building, the Odun Pazar Modern Museum. And as we know, the museum is located in Eskişehir and it is also located next to the Odun Pazar Historical Urban Site, which is on the list of uh, UNESCO's World Heritage List. Um, let me introduce myself. My name is Ece and I'm a senior architecture student in Bilkent University. And today's session I will be moderating with Esin Ayk and Asana Özal. They can introduce themselves also. Hello everyone, welcome to our event. And uh, thank you, Esin. Uh, before we start, as Bilkent University Design and Architecture Society, uh, we would like to thank you one more time in advance to Ms. Yuki Kikuchi and to Ms. Yasemi Shahiner for accepting our request to arrange this special event. Um, also, I would like to say that uh, they were very kind and helpful throughout the uh, organization of the uh, event. And also, uh, before the pandemic, they were also very kind to uh, organize a face-to-face -face event with us. But however, as we know, due to the pandemic, we had to change our way, so we had to make it online. But on the other side, we are very much happy because right now we have more than 200 participants uh, from different universities and from different cities of Turkey. Uh, also, additionally, I would like to uh, thanks to Ms. Bengu Kyrgyz Argyvan. Uh, she is the communication director of the Odun Pazar Museum. Uh, she helped us throughout the process to be get in touch with the museum. And also, lastly, another special thanks to, to our weekend faculty professor uh, who didn't um, leave us alone today. And also uh, they were always supporting our events and they were also very curious about this event too. And I think these are all I can say for now. So I am leaving the speech to Essin for her to explain how we proceed today. Thank you, Eze, uh, for the introduction. We appreciate it. It's great to host all of you here today, and we're very excited to realize this event with Kengo Kuma and Associates on their uh, outstanding Odun Pazar Modern Museum. The museum's uh, unique quality of being a contemporary design um, with a traditional approach has been f fascinating many of us since uh, the first day it was published. And we're all amazed by the way how it takes place next to the traditional Eskişehir Odun Pazarı houses, uh, the world's cultural heritage, in a very unexpected yet harmonic way. So um, here we would like to congratulate Kengo Kuma and Associates one more on winning the International Project of the Year Award over one million pounds in scope of the 18th um, Museum and Heritage Awards. And now I would like to um, tell you about how we will proceed with the event. So uh, first of all, dear uh, Yuki Gekuchi and Yasemi China will start with a brief presentation about themselves. And then they will move on with a uh, very exciting presentation about the uh, Odun Pazarı Modern Museum. They will, talk, uh, they will tell us about uh, the design processes, uh, concept derivation and realization, challenges that has been faced and uh, any other information they want to share with us. And then we will move on uh, with the questions and answers session. So uh, now I would like to leave the floor to Ms. Yuki Ikekuchi and Ms. Yasemin Shainer. Hey, thank you very much for a super nice introduction. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, learning the fact that it's been organized by the students and such motivated people like yourselves, I'm pretty impressed <laughs> about this. Uh, it's very important, I think, that learning people uh, organized and motivated to, um, to promote this an exchange. And we are very honored and very happy and excited to have a chance to present our projects to all of you. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, and also the fact that it's always really interesting to have the feedbacks 
from the people who are actually in that country that we built the project in. Um, because, you know, it's at the end of the day, it's very important to that architecture and what we built, what we designed truly contributes to the cultural values, society and culture. So um, we will be very happy to receive any remarks or comments afterwards. Um, yeah, looking forward to it. Um, uh, let us briefly introduce ourselves. Um, I am Yuki Higuchi. I'm a partner uh, architect at King Okuman Associates. Um, and I've been in charge of uh, directing the design of uh, Oden Pazari Museum. Hi everyone, I'm Yasin Mishahinaj. Um, I'm project manager and project architect in King Okuma and Associates. Uh, since, since six years, I started in Japan and moved to Paris two years ago. I was, um, I was proud and happy to be the project manager of Odun Pazari Museum working with Yuki Keguchi. Thank you very much. Um, perhaps I can say a few words about our, our philosophy in designing architecture. Um, as you might know, <laughs> our work, uh, most of it, it's, it has this uh, starts with the keen interest of uh, natural materials and understanding the site context, uh, culture and history of where we're built in. And also and lately, uh, we have been more and more aware of uh, achieving the biophilic design in belief that the natural environment, natural elements uh, are the source of inspiration where we find the comforts around us. This regardless of where we are, uh, whether we are in a museum or in the office or at home, wherever you spend most of your time or in a short period of time, it's, uh, it's fundamental and desire that we all have to be connected and to be surrounded by nature and natural elements. Um, and it matters uh, even more and more now in this um, pandemic situation. Uh, we are forced, to, or we have to stay inside, keep some distance, and to have this, uh, you know, a sense of confinement. It's really uh, psychologically, it's a bearing. And it matters even more how we design this biophilic approach and achieving the space in our internal environments. So yeah, all in all, that's uh, what we believe it's important for us to achieve in design. This Odun Pazari Museum, it's not an exception. Okay, let's start presenting our work. Um, so this museum uh, was completed last year and uh, we had a quite successful inaugurations and has been received well, I believe. Uh, however, due to this, uh, you know, the latest situations and museum had a hard time uh, of uh, opening up to a larger audience, but I believe it slowly, slowly start to pick up again. So um, if you have a chance, please do visit. Um, so the museum, it's uh, um, completed last year. And as you can see, it's really built in timber. Uh, how we started looking into the timber, use of the timber is of course, it is to do with the natural philosophy that we have, applying the natural materials to express the building itself. But also uh, the hint came uh, from the name of the Pazari, uh, the Timba, the wooden market, that to uh, celebrate and the memory of how the city or the area used to function. So uh, the name itself is represented by the use uh, for uh, extensive uh, timber use. It's a reminder uh, of how this city has been uh, developing um, in a historic original sense. Okay, here, uh, maybe it relates a bit of how we start out approaching the design. Uh, it is very important for us to understand the context uh, culture and tradition in architecture, in arts, in culture. Um, so, of course, the timber is uh, is um, used as a building architecture in a Turkish uh, environment, as well as as well as uh, a Japanese tradition. This is something that we have in common. But uh, modern time, it has been replaced with a lot of concrete and steel structure to make you know uh, make things uh, easier to be built. Uh, and it's such a pity that we don't experience this fully uh, warm texture of the wood uh, to construct the building. So, um, because it has a lot of complications, it has a lot of uh, maintenance uh, bearing. 
uh, but uh, now it's uh, it was an opportunity to for us to bring back and to share this uh, you know um, share this uh, uh, good uh, aspect of the pin by itself yeah um, okay. Someone with me, it's okay. I will be doing it. <laughs> That's okay. And the second is the city of Pazari. Uh, it has this very unique, beautiful, um, old traditional residential area that has this uh, um, this uh, scale and the streetscape that the uh, that is defined by the series of a uh, rotated and uh, unique geometry of the building. So that's one thing that we wanted to uh, look into. And uh, some aspects such as uh, quality of light that is significant in the mosque that you see the strong contrast between the light beams uh, that are shed through the darkness of the of both surfaces. That's something we wanted to incorporate uh, into our museum. Uh, geometric approach, um, it's quite evident in the history of, the, of your cultures and architecture that uh, we start with the uh, simple geometry manipulated to create a uh, quite complex pattern. And uh, that's another aspect. Lastly, is this uh, um, traditional public building complex uh, that it's a composition of the aggregates and it's in nature for the purpose of contributing uh, to the community. So um, it's something that we wanted to look into uh, in order to generate our architectural concept and volumes. Uh, one typical scene of the residential area in Odom Pazari. As you can see, a uh, ground floor, it follows this meandering path of the street where upper level, it, it has this twist and rotations from the ground floor plane. Uh, so this in itself, it creates this really interesting and playful dynamic uh, void street scenes that we thought it's going to be um, and tools to generate our project as well. Uh, this is the overall view of the Odum Pazari Museum. So as you can see, the volumetric strategy is to, uh, to break uh, the volumes into uh, many small aggregates, uh, but the scale of each boxes are relative to the adjacent buildings. Um, as you can see, I don't know if you can see the casa, there's this uh, a huge boulevard that are um, uh, pretty busy in traffic. And these uh, buildings adjacent to these streets are rather new, while the smaller aggregates that you see behind the museums are more from the older age. So uh, we wanted to combine these two scale of an urban scale versus this smaller scale. Uh, but it's evident uh, that the rest of the city also, it's not organized in the uh, perpendicular or grid manner, but all of them, uh, it has this rotated, uh, more spontaneous dynamic angles to it, which makes the entire city quite charming. So by taking this focus of these rotations and more spontaneous meandering paths into the design of the museum itself, we have kept this uh, plaza as a continuation of the public space and also taking in the strategy of twisting and rotating uh, of uh, composing the space inside the museum. Uh, one example to highlight this uh, uh, aggregation and this simple geometry manipulated by rotation. So this is uh, more evident perhaps uh, in the atrium space that we strategically um, placed. Uh, this uh, amazing <laughs> contrast, uh, quality of the lights, uh, and also by aggregation, but starting with the smaller, lower volumes along the street front or the public plaza front, uh, where one could relate better with the human scale and slowly compose to become a large open space. So this uh, somehow uh, we were focusing on uh, in the initial stage, how to relate to the smaller scale of the residential area, and but still to have this groundness that the some of the exhibition space is expected of. Uh, so, yeah, so this is a site plan. As you can see, those Mandarin Street, we kept by uh, throwing this uh, Mandarin paths and the, have the open plaza that dedicates to several facilities around. But the placement of the boxes somehow, the scale of it, 
it relates to some of the new buildings with the larger portion, but still the smaller, um, smaller part and lower part of the building, it relates to more traditional uh, housing scales. So by stacking these volumes to the higher level, this is still uh, quite um, recognizable, outstanding, uh, compared to the rest of the uh, existing building. Of course, it's, it was, we, we didn't believe that it was our mission to replicate uh, um, the traditional way of designing the building, but relates, uh, extract the essence of the architectural design and relates to the scale, relates to the fundamentals uh, of the geometry, but still to, uh, to express itself as something new, something contemporary, something outstanding. Uh, out of context, uh, which is uh, newness that people would desire, considering that Eskishe has such a dynamic uh, atmosphere with the younger generations and learning generation, so that it offers this uh, opportunity to become fun and active uh, cultural facility. Uh, so in a way that it announces itself to the multi-direction. So the museum, it's not a frontal, it's, it doesn't have front or back. It faces to all uh, different directions to, to be legible, uh, to announce itself um, by the people who are approaching from uh, different directions. And at the end, this is a photo of how it's built. Uh, so you can recognize that the, it has this multiple phase and the lower volume actually is the human scale. The height of it, it's more relating to the residents rather than the taller buildings. Uh, and the taller part of the project, it has a certain scale um, that speaks uh, as an um, independent icon. And this is a zoom up of the, floor, uh, the roof plan. Uh, the benefit of having this multi step though, that we can create a quite unique scale, individual scales uh, uh, for the exhibition uh, itself. And also that the sun portion that connects an interior as a, it could be used as a terraces or an open spaces that, uh, that one could enjoy as a spillover from an interior activities. Uh, take you through very quickly on the floor plans. Uh, first is the ground floor. So one would enter through the museum this way and navigating uh, uh, your way through this uh, rotating uh, staircase. Uh, we're just revolving around the central atrium that we would show you later. And uh, we wanted to have as much uh, public space as open, as accessible as possible to, uh, to this plaza, uh, because we believe that the nature of the museum, uh, it no longer just support exhibitions on, uh, for the arts uh, viewing sake, but it needs to take this role as uh, a communication um, space uh, that are active and to be used as an everyday uh, inspirational, activated, uh, animated uh, space that works really together with the open uh, plaza. Um, so it has this different nature to gravitate in and to offer a space to communicate uh, with the communities uh, and the cultural information. So uh, the ground floor is meant to uh, serve for these purposes. Um, and that's a connection uh, that we find it quite essential to the city. Uh, this is the section, as uh, you can recognize, there's this cut through vertically, uh, the void, uh, that we place the skylights through. So this has this uh, a bit of like a tornado rotations in growing where it cut, catches the natural lights uh, uh, from above. And it connects from one level to another also vertically as a void. Uh, and one, one thing that uh, I wanted to highlight by showing the section is that this museum uh, is uh, for the collection of uh, Mr. Tabancha, who is the owner of Polymex Construction Company. And the collection, it's mostly um, uh, in a theme of Turkish art, contemporary and modern, but it has a, a diverse uh, characters and diverse scales from small sculptures, small paintings to the writings to large scale paintings. So it was quite important for us that we offer uh, as diverse 
uh, scale as possible within the museum. So as you can see, some it goes up to 6.4 uh, floor to ceiling height for large scale installation. Uh, mostly those high scale installation spaces are uh, placed on the ground floor. So when you are approaching or delivering the loading from the ground surface, it's easier to access and to install the large pieces. For the upper level, it gets slightly smaller for a smaller art pieces, more intimate, more uh, secluded uh, installations that you have a better control of the lights and so on. So all in all, this is to say that we have uh, many um, multiple uh, exhibition spaces that has a particular scale for particular arts. Uh, so this is the ground floor space. Uh, this, this is the main entrance that you enter through the plaza and find your way revolving around this central atrium. Uh, this space, it's not just a means of uh, um, um, to, for an inviting floor or entrance, but we imagine designing this space uh, to be used for a gathering, a uh, spontaneous seating area. One can you know, spend time reading books with the, the coffee on your hands or uh, for uh, different purposes of the events. Uh, we can a hold a lecture there. Uh, some performance even, so uh, where the audience could be, audience seating could be uh, placed here, the small performance stage could be placed on the bottom side. So we hope that this would serve for a multiple purpose. And uh, there's the height difference between the main entrance of the plaza to the loading slash another uh, side of the uh, walkthrough that leads your way to the smaller uh, part, more traditional residential part of the, uh, of the open pasari. Uh, here it has this uh, tallest uh, installation space that has 6.4 ceiling to floor height. Uh, and this is, uh, maybe you'll see it later, that it has this uh, new uh, on-site installation uh, pieces. And the other uh, spaces uh, now is dedicated for the boutique and small exhibition space that has also visual connections or direct access from the street level. Uh, this is uh, uh, looking at the this uh, fanning uh, bleachers or the steps and how it revolves itself and naturally lead your way inside the exhibition space. Uh, another important thing, important aspect of designing the space is that uh, we are creating this uh, um, visual connections from one level to another. Um, so this exposure or um, communication visually from one space to another, it has this sense of animated, activated uh, um, atmosphere. Um, if uh, we can talk a bit about the aim or the purpose of having this atrium, uh, from my viewpoint, it has three major purposes of having this atrium. One is to take in the natural light very softly and disperse it to uh, the exhibition space. As you might all know um, or notice that the control of natural light is a um, very critical aspect in designing the museum. Uh, one is that it could have a negative effect on the artwork itself but it could work beautifully for some of the arts, such as installations or sculpture pieces. And it, adds, it, it would add another sense of uh, quality and space if we take in the natural light very softly, indirectly. So this one serves for that purpose. Uh, second is that for the museum, how we could promote the flow, it's also quite critical in a sense of uh, uh, applying the circulation. So by having this rotation and atrium in the center, one would always find the way to move around it. So it gives a good sense of uh, um, guiding the flow and the way you find the, uh, each individual exhibition space around this always, around this atrium space. Uh, the last is, uh, it's, it has this symbolic aspect of a central of all these uh, volumes, that this twist is something contemporary, um, other than just expressing the boxes around it, but it appears so in a way that it is a result of this dynamic uh, planning. 
So this twist, uh, it's symbolic in a symbolic way. It appears to be like a center uh, of a stone in a way that you find the calmness within the dynamic nature of the space. Um, yeah, so that's how we aim to aimed uh, from the beginning uh, in designing this space. And then at the end, this becomes a special space for performance or um, unique installation that we, we hope that museum would, uh, would come up with the evolving uh, programs for this. And, and at the end, it, the installation became uh, quite, I mean, the construction itself for the atrium um, has many complications, but the result shows a uh, quite successful effect, I believe. Uh, that's the complication <laughs> in short, uh, because the museum, it has this uh, primary structure made out of steel and uh, the timber cladings and the interior fittings. But uh, by having these rotations, then it, it, um, it imposed uh, um, many challenges. But uh, even the exposed steel structure, uh, we believe is quite, um, it has a sense of aesthetic. Uh, this is the bamboo piece and in art installations by uh, Chikun Sai. He's a Japanese uh, artist um, in Kyoto. Oh, maybe it's in Osaka. Osaka. Yeah. And he, his, um, um, his family is uh, it's very traditional and they own this forest of bamboo where they create their art pieces or crafts from. Uh, and what's amazing about this piece is that this is all uh, composed without any fixing metals or nails. Uh, it's just put together by method of weaving. And so when they dismantle this piece, uh, they can just dismantle, dismantle it one by one for the next installation. So this would never die. It was just, you know, keep on, um, keep on living. Uh, from one location to another in a different form. Uh, it's, it's quite a concept, sustainable concept, as well as this uh, reborn and recreation. It's something that we thought is so beautiful besides the aesthetic piece uh, of itself. So the tallest space, as we were showing in the section earlier, it has 6.4 um, floor to ceiling height that could accommodate these kind of a large pieces. Uh, and again, this has, um, uh, viewing points from the upper level where one could perceive the art pieces from above. Uh, what's also important for us to create in creating this space is the natural light. Uh, we always imagine this space as one of the unique ones that the art piece could interact with the natural light and it gives such um, texture and depth and quality added to the, uh, to the art installation itself. Uh, on the upper levels, uh, we have a quite um, simpler configurations of the exhibition space uh, that uh, the artworks could be arranged within its own controlled uh, light effect. And others are uh, here at triangulated space for mostly viewing the um, large scale installations from above and so on. Uh, and so this has an opportunity to, um, to um, integrate the outdoor spaces such as here. And this could also be a multi-purpose space uh, that take advantage, that could take advantage of the exterior terraces outside. And here you see maybe effect of this softly filtered natural light uh, we take in the natural light from a skylight above, but it's never direct. Uh, you could see the leaking lights uh, through this timber frame that it gives this sense of warmth and uh, richness. Uh, uh, for the museum though, um, often that it's really a requirement for each art pieces to have a focused uh, lighting, and artificial lights that are suited for uh, experiencing uh, the communications with the art um, to the viewers. So well, we wanted to balance these two aspects of designing the museum that is very critical, um, a strategy that you need to tackle and envision from the very beginning. 
And the last one, uh, actually we had this uh, um, uh, opening, we created this opening uh, probably halfway through the uh, design process. Uh, and the top floor, it has this uh, opportunity to look down and into the void spaces that gives uh, another opportunity to view a uh, special installations or viewing points from above. So it added, uh, um, I think, the good quality of opening up and the sense of suspending the light well, uh, it worked out pretty well uh, with the rest of the art pieces as well. Um, so this is the design of the atrium. Uh, it revolves around the, actually, the exhibition spaces revolves around the atrium. And the openings of the cuts are controlled in such a way that it gives adequate sense of lights to each one of the spaces. And the rotation are a pivot around this corner. And this has a lot of, um, let me say, it serves, I believe, uh, the way to navigate the people, especially at the ground floor. Well, when you enter, you're naturally drawn to the entrance of the exhibition space. So once again, uh, it acts also as a guide for navigation through one exhibition space to another. Um, and it has another um, leading uh, space. Uh, once you are on the ground floor, uh, beginning of the exhibition, it twists downwards to the basement level. And underneath the staircase, uh, we had this opportunity to work with the museum to create another uh, projection rooms uh, for uh, this kind of an art um, display. Uh, okay, so the facade, uh, as you might uh, see in, in our uh, series of work by Kim Okuma, associates that we use a timber quite extensively. And in, in some ways, or in most of the time, it relates to the traditional way of composing uh, um, the timber. In this particular project, though, we wanted to express it more like a structural uh, <laughs> expression and also uh, this uh, interlocking in the corners. Uh, uh, this also relates to the idea of um, celebrating the memory of uh, um, Udenpazari, uh, the wooden markets, where a simple stacking of the timbers are um, sensed. And this uh, stack, uh, stacking of the timbers are something that we've been exploring structurally um, for uh, some of the Japanese project as a um, unique way of, uh, and it relates to the traditional of a timber structure. Um, so this is a brick museum, museum that we have built in Japan and uh, it has similarity. It's not a solid mass uh, timber, but it's an engineered uh, laminated uh, timber that is more like a contemporary or modern way of uh, using the timber. Um, yeah, in such way that we have related um, this method uh, extensively for this project. But this timber screen also, it acts as a um, way to control uh, natural light in and out. So yeah, that's how we started uh, expressing it. And uh, I'll pass a couple of slides to Yasmin uh, to, so that she can take you through how this has been implemented in the design process so that this uh, composition of the structure volumes in the facade could be developed for the construction purposes. Um, yes, we thought it could be exciting uh, to show you uh, a bit more than what you see in the pictures or maybe what you can find online. So you can relate also since a um, big, bigger part of the audience is students, it's also a way for you to relate your design processes and for you to imagine how it's going to be carried on out on site, even though uh, systems can be um, rather complex or innovative. So in our case, or in, in, in any case as such, uh, a way to um, deal with a complex system is through uh, layering the information. So here you see that um, the, the system of construction is uh, on the left. Uh, we have a reinforced concrete foundation and ground floor level, uh, which receives the steel uh, mainframe that constitutes the main structure of the building. 
On top of it, we receive we uh, we have the secondary steel member elements that um, that is made of uh, glazing systems or light gauge steel wall enclosures that encloses the building. And then we have the wooden facade layer where we control the apertures, uh, where we have the play of light connection, visual connection, and all these aspects coming together as the last layer. Uh, all these information, as you can easily see and imagine, is a bit more complex than a traditional way of producing drawings and elevations and sections. Mm -hmm. Therefore, most of the process uh, was done between our local collaborators, us uh, and us, as well as the manufacturer, through the exchange of extensive 3D information. Uh, this is uh, in our office, uh, in addition to a series of physical, making physical models and uh, countless explorations, uh, uh, we uh, very much uh, implement this uh, 3D uh, workflow in our, um, in our daily um, practice. And it's very helpful and useful in communication and outputting even the manufacturing information. So in most of the cases, uh, this is how we communicated with our engineers, with our local architect, with people on site and our manufacturers for the wood or steel. Uh, a little bit of um, uh, how it looks like. Uh, we tag and number each elements, each facade, and we lay them out. And that's how we uh, trace the information uh, of complexity as such. Um, I will quickly show you also this one. Uh, the, the reason being, if you start changing one area, you would easily notice that this is all connected. You end up going all around the building. And with the traditional way of drawing sections and elevations, this won't be possible. So this has been a very efficient way for us to design as well as to communicate. Uh, very shortly, uh, the information about the manufacturing aspects of the facade. We use the Siberian yellow pine. It is sourced from abroad, however, manufactured and produced in Turkey. And uh, we went through a series of optimization with our structural team uh, to, um, to minimize the amount of material that goes into, into construction and production. And just also to give you a framework of workflow, we mainly use Rhino uh, with our local collaborators Revit and Tecla and uh, CNC milling outputting for the wooden elements that are carried on site just to be assembled onto the metal fixation elements. So yeah, this is just a summary of uh, the facade system and construction. So this shows a uh, result of this uh, design process and explorations. Um, so outcome of it, uh, I, I would say it's quite uh, successful, <laughs> if you may say. Uh, so it has some variance though, and the sizing of the timber, as well as the uh, openings from one timber elements to another. Uh, this has been thought out strategically so that the lighting, uh, natural light ingress for a certain exhibition spaces are controlled properly. And uh, we have uh, here and there some uh, spaces that could be uh, flexible, flexibly used for uh, different purposes. So it's a multi-purpose spaces for events or gathering. Um, so there are some space that are rather to be open and enjoy the view uh, and the access from indoor to outdoor. So um, yeah, for instance, this one, it's uh, timber elements is uh, slightly lifted. So on the top levels, then it would allow visitors to go out and to see the views or enjoy outdoor spaces. Uh, and um, you might see some of the timbers are installed against the glazing openings, uh, and some of them are uh, installed against the concrete surfaces. So it would be more a uh, cladding uh, over the uh, solid surfaces than screening effects or in front of the glazing surfaces. Uh, it's nice and snowy in Eskishe. <laughs> there are a lot of challenges also during the constructions, uh, this temperature difference and humidity difference. Um, yeah, the workers uh, have done the incredible job um, yeah, overcoming these challenges. And this is closer to the completions of the building. Um, so some of it, it has a larger openings to allow a slightly screen off, but still open uh, a sense of space from ground floor going into the museum. 
some of them are, are having the larger apertures to relate to the ground floor openings. Some are placed in front of the, in front of the glazing and you see the effects with the lights as such. Um, so, well, the lighting strategy, not only for an exhibition spaces, but how to light up, uh, how to achieve this um, soft glow of lights uh, for an, an architecture was very, very um, challenging. Um, so uh, many uh, um, timber surfaces that act as a filter it filters the natural lights in uh, to the exhibition spaces in the daytime, while uh, it it uh, it gives this soft glow when it's lit from inside and leaves the lights to outside. Uh, but the um, other areas, for instance, the facade against the staircase or the facade above the openings in the cafe, we have um, used this strategy of uh, backlit or front lit uh, to wash the texture of the timber. So it has a multiple um, strategy in approaching the lighting effects uh, depends on the detail or how the uh, timbers are composed. Um, yeah, so I guess that's pretty much the end of our uh, presentation and I'd be curious to, um, to hear your questions and uh, anything that you would like to ask, more than welcome to. Uh, so I would like to first thank you very much for this nice and comprehensive presentation and the visuals included. So it was very informative and educative for us, especially for our uh, design faculty students. Also, it's very valuable us to listen to the process behind this building, uh, which has been fascinating all of us. And even though we are not in Eskisha here and we are doing this event online, I believe for everyone, I felt like a real time a virtual tour. So for those who haven't got any chance to visit this museum, in me included, I believe we have uh, probably the best information we can have. And also for uh, the weekend students uh, who take GE courses, uh, you can write your names and ID numbers in chat privately to the Chala Gench only, uh, then we can upload your points. So uh, here I would like to go on with the question and answer sessions. Uh, we will first ask a couple of questions as we gathered previously uh, from our society. So after that, you can raise your hand, use your uh, raise your hand button to ask your question, or you can directly write your uh, question on the chat. But we would prefer you to unmute yourself and ask your question to experience a more interactive session. Uh, however, we are also uh, open to the questions on chat. So the very first question from our society is, um, since we follow your other projects as well, and we see that you are very successful at using wood and timber in architecture, uh, we were wondering uh, whether uh, it was the reason that Kengo Kuma and Associates got this project because of its success in wood, uh, or were you invited uh, to get the project? Mm. Well, it's Sure, the uh, owner of this museum with the collection um, to, who had a desire to exhibit uh, his pieces in Eskishe where he was born, uh, he uh, kindly approached us to design this building. Um, I believe it's mostly for uh, our extensive use of the timba and the approach uh, in designing with the natural elements such as wood, stone, Etc. Yeah, so I believe it could be one of the reasons. Okay, thank you for uh, your answer. So um, I had a question when uh, you were mentioning with the life strategies, you told that um, it was challenging to deal with um, different types of lighting. Mm -hmm. So uh, what were the, besides lighting, uh, what were the other um, challenges you um, come face to face with? It can be about construction processes, it can be about design or the uh, collaboration mm -hmm. between different disciplines. 
-hmm. Yes. Thank you. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, and yes, each project has its own challenges. Uh, in this case particular, uh, the benefit um, was that the owner is a construction company. So they have their own teams and uh, people that they normally work with for um, skills or other elements of the uh, construction. So it made us uh, um, a faster way to build these projects. Um, so many processes were more optimized. Uh, in a traditional manner uh, for the architects to draw up all the documents and to be ready for a contractor to draw up construction documents, manufacturer to draw up a shop drawings. This whole process was extremely optimized um, into a shorter term working with this, uh, um, with this clients as a contractor. Well, that was uh, one benefit uh, I believe it's also a practice. Maybe it's a it's something that we would like to ask uh, maybe your professors, if my uh, view might be somehow near <laughs> the the method uh, doing the architecture, realizing the architecture in Turkey, is that this um, uh, drawing process that we we often do in Japan or in other state like states or in Europe. Uh, this might have a shorter span in the Turkish uh, construction practice. Uh, in, as I said, in this case, for this particular project, it, it worked uh, quite advant advantageously for us that we could shorten the, uh, the process to have more like a shortcut um, to talk to the manufacturer, talk to the contractor directly to take decisions. Uh, but that said, uh, the shortening of the process was quite challenging for us not to have every, um, how do say, not to have an overall view in every detail already planned out, but we need to move forward very fast to catch up even uh, the each uh, builders and manufacturers. So that was uh, a really challenging, a new experience for us. So we need to respond to multiple aspects of the uh, construction simultaneously. <laughs> so this forced us to uh, foresee the concerns or challenges beforehand. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, it was very difficult. Mm. Thank you for your comprehensive answer. And um, I guess we started receiving some questions and um, mm -hmm. some are writing through the chat and some are uh, just raising hands. Um, so we can start with um, one of our um, instructors, Özge Selandran, wants to uh, ask you a question. Hello, first of all, welcome, uh, as it virtually, but we would like <laughs> to uh, welcome you on our in our faculty, of course, but uh, thank you once more for your great presentation. Uh, I was uh, somehow coming from the practice, so I have uh, recently returned back to academia. So basing on your experience to work with a contractor as a client, mm. I would just like uh, want to ask that because one of our most um, hardest, hardest, let's say, uh, challenges was to convince our contractors as if they are clients also about the usage of, uh, in quotations, expensive materials. As we know that timber is one of the not cheapest materials in Turkey construction mm -hmm. industry, but your main concept and contextual say, grounding was basing on it. What was the uh, negotiation uh, or the convincing strategies of you about this much of a uh, spectacular material uh, mm. usages? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, I first off, I would like to say that the mission that was given by the clients, the motivation of the clients are slightly different, I would say. It's not a standard uh, contract as uh, our clients, but it's just that the, the, um, the, the client side, they happen to be a contractor, but they are born and raised in Eskishe, and they have this keen interest of um, bringing up the cultural awareness they almost took it as a mission uh, to contribute their, to their city that they are born in. 
So it wasn't a you know, pure business uh, or uh, for the sake of building the building, but it has a more profound uh, mission and that uh, the owner has uh, had, had in mind from the very beginning. So the, the ground plane that we started with, uh, slightly different than these, uh, uh, what's called the traditional design build uh, sort of uh, um, contract. So that helped us greatly uh, to aim for uh, quality. And uh, yes, you are uh, absolutely right. So building with the timber, it's not easy. And as you we were uh, mentioning at the beginning of the presentation, nowadays, uh, it's a trouble. Um, I mean, workability is high in timber, but the way to process it outside, bring in and protect it, and to maintain for future, it's, uh, it's a whole lot of... Uh, um, yeah, efforts and uh, that the, as an owner of the museum needs to take it into consideration. Uh, so, well, uh, I think what made us easier, it's, it's not a whole lot of convincing that we have to do, but more to work with them to preserve this quality. Um, so owner actually sent uh, his uh, team and the manufacturer, timber manufacturer to Japan with us so that we learn from each other uh, so one manufacturer that we visited, uh, they have uh, walked them through uh, from the sourcing of materials, inspecting uh, the uh, process in factory so that quality could be achieved. Um, so it, it was very difficult for a manufacturer to reach to the high level of a precision. And uh, um, yeah, but it was a quite interesting learning process from both ends. So yeah, I'm not sure if I'm answering your questions, but uh, my point is that uh, the owner as a contractor has a, a different sense of a, a mission. So that made us uh, really uh, easy and even fascinating to, to achieve this quality. We were lucky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you were lucky and now we are lucky to have this uh, building in our context. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you, Rajam, also. And Dilara is also raising her hand, and she can speak. Uh, hello. Um, I had a question about the environmental systems that were used uh, in the building during the design and construction process. Uh, mainly what has uh, me thinking was that most of the fragmented facades are quite like covered up with the uh, timber pieces and everything. And I know that you, you explained that you're receiving diffuse light from the top and, uh, and things like that, but was there any specific use of south light in terms of environmental technology inside the building or any other systems such as stormwater management and stuff mm -hmm. like that that you gave a focus to? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> you want to take this one? <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say the simple answer to this question is uh, no, we have not integrated uh, um, sustainable building uh, strategies uh, from, uh, yeah, from the beginning of design in our building. Hmm. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> but we did focus on cultural sustainability, I would say, hmm. integration of uh, the whole surrounding context in a, in a, in a different cultural setting uh, that is um, highly beneficial for the society and even for the surrounding. Uh, Thank you for your answer. And Dokan has also raised her, his hand, and uh, now he can ask. Hello, I'm freshman student from Tobetu. And my question is about, um, I don't know if it's actually your job, but um, you know, um, natural disasters occurs around the world and um, how durable the structure against natural disasters such as earthquake um, what did you consider or did you consider anything? Oh, yes, I mean, structure, but there's a, a regulations that needs to comply for the seismic resistance. So yes, uh, all the structures are designed in considerations to meet regulated uh, level of resistance against the seismic um, events, yeah. Thank you. 
Thank you for your question and answer. Uh, also, could I uh, raise his hand? Mm -hmm. Can ask. Uh, hi, I'm a, a, I'm a student in Durkent University. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that it was a really nice presentation. Uh, my question is that, like, how did you approach to uh, settlement of this diverse design? So, uh, as far as I can see, it was a sloped hill. So what were the steps and the challenges? Uh, sorry, uh, just to understand your question quickly, in terms of building on this slope site or um, else? Well, uh, designing and building. Mm -hmm. uh, on the site that has a different uh, height, is, is that what you mean? Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, it has some height differences uh, from the uh, plaza level to the street level, but uh, we took it as an uh, opportunity so uh, con to create the link in continuity from uh, uh, entrance level of the plaza and to go down to the street level. So this descending uh, moment that links from one uh, open uh, public area to the smaller scale of the project, a uh, street, uh, street scale. So yeah, that was uh, the way that we took advantage of um, to, to build uh, the buildings on the top of this um, slope site or different uh, heights. Yeah, so, but the, yeah, you're right that there are some challenges though um, to, how, to create the adequate uh, height for entrance because entrance in this case, it got squeezed while when it's this start to descend, it creates its uh, higher um, seating heights. But in a way, maybe it was uh, end up to be uh, quite interesting because you start in you know, a very small uh, openings and then you start to have uh, larger openings towards uh, the directions that you, uh, you experience the museum of. So yeah, that's probably, um, we started with the challenge, but we turned this into uh, a spatial uh, interesting quality, I believe. Yeah. Thank you. Hmm. Well, thank you again. And Shebnam, you can ask your question. Thanks. Um, first of all, thanks for this fruitful presentation. Um, I want to ask you something different. So this building was constructed just before I um, I chose to be an architect. And um, as we all know, some cities are related with the um, architectural structures and some cities are um, having a meaning in our mind with those structures. So in our first year in the university, we had a class um, we were talking about those art museums, those um, um, cities and kinds. So when I first met Om, I thought it was uh, similar with the case in Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao. So do you think that this museum, this architectural structure, had the same effect as Bilbao? Uh, had from the Guggenheim Museum. How was the reactions from the first, firstly in the citizens and from above, from the world? Mm -hmm. hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think in recent years, um, often that museum it, is expected to have this, what's called the Bilbao effect that becomes like this uh, huge event or change that transform the uh, city. Um, so in that sense, um, it could be. What might be different in our approach is that Bilbao, this wow effect in the city is created by the contrast. So it is needed to be as different as possible from the rest of the building in the city. Well, this one in our approach, it's a bit of a boss. Uh, we derive this building out of the context and extracting what we find attractive and amazing in the surroundings, implement it in a new way. So uh, although it has this distinctive appearance, it should, or we hope that it would 
gives the sense of familiarity that eventually in hope that it will be rooted in the community. So people would start recognizing the link from uh, your neighbors to this building. Uh, so it's a bit of a boast, the newness and the sense of familiarity. Uh, so yes, um, yes to your question that uh, this might have uh, this unique presence, the newness to the community that activates the scene and becomes central uh, a space for attraction for uh, the outsiders, uh, international attention could be called for, but uh, our intention is also in a smaller uh, view and that it, in hope that this would be rooted and becomes a continuation of the history. Uh, so, yeah. Thank you, okay. Hmm. Thank you for the question and the answer. And then if you can ask now. Hi, firstly, thanks for your uh, wonderful presentation. I am a third year student from the Kent University, also a member of the Design and Architecture Society. My question about the, uh, you know, this is a modern museum in a center of the traditional context, and it is surrounded by the workshop uh, owned by the local craftsmen, uh, craftsmen or artists. And there is also a special form that art form that protected by uh, Turkish uh, culture minister. Did you connect with the uh, this artist or craftsman for the contribution for your design or art install, uh, installations? We have uh, in the first round, a uh, couple rounds of the visit, um, the mayor, as well as uh, the clients, uh, Mr. Tavancha, uh, expose us to the opportunity to uh, see these galleries and workshop for the glass art pieces and others like wax museums. And we had uh, nice conversations with the mayors. Um, so yes, we had the, um, the sense, we, we had the sense of this craftsmanship in arts uh, that we wanted to take it into consideration designing in our building. Um, so, well, not necessarily relating to the art piece uh, of their craft itself, but to open to their uh, space for creation. Uh, for instance, one side of the smaller street adjacent to the museum, our Mora Museum, it has a series of uh, workshops. So we wanted to relate the program inside. So it's, it could suggest uh, either setting in the boutique those uh, uh, unique, beautiful pieces that are created by this craftsman, or to have an opportunity to uh, for uh, having more workshop. Uh, so interactions with the traditional craftsmen and the new designers could be promoted in one of the programs eventually in the future of the museum. So yeah, that, that has a lot of uh, uh, great uh, insights um, and it influences the way that we uh, open the museum, relate to the, uh, this um, yeah, artisans that are adjacent to the museum. Yeah, if that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, now we will entertain uh, Doa Sakunji's question. Hello, thank you so much for your presentation. I am Doa. I am a senior student at Buchanan University and a member of Design and Architecture Society. I would like to ask a question. I think you have also mentioned about it, but uh, maybe you can explain more detailly. Uh, the most prominent feature of the project site is its traditional Eskisehir context. We can say that the building displays a contemporary architectural approach, having traditional hints and references as well. How was this major design idea developed? What were the main considerations regarding the context? And how were these inputs translated into a contemporary understanding? Mm. Well, uh, it's a combination of many things. Um, because, well, as I am a Japanese architect, I would never pretend that I have a deeper understanding of the architecture than yourself, uh, all of you. Uh, but uh, this gives me a lot of opportunity to see the context from uh, 
completely different viewpoints and to find the uh, charms and, uh, and beauty in the things that you might be so familiar with. So something like this uh, adjacent to this uh, um, site, uh, as we were showing in earlier slides, uh, it gives us this, uh, you know, very, uh, it's very attractive in a sense that if you walk on the street, even though if you're not inside the building, the space is created between the buildings. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in the life that is found in between the buildings uh, as equal to the life that is found inside the building. That's the urban context that we all need to be cautiously create or maybe spontaneously generated by having a good uh, architecture intent. Um, so the space that are outside and uh, void that is created in between the building, it, it's, uh, it's something that we need to focus on in generating the new architecture. It has an effect, uh, not only creating a space inside, but it creates the outdoor space in between the, what's existing and what's new. So uh, what, we, what I felt is really interesting is the space in between created by these rotated residences and they are not built in a straight uh, parallel way, but they are created in a meandering path. So that's uh, one of the uh, essence that we find so interesting to be implemented, uh, not just formal, formalistic approach of composing the boxes, but to create this kind of a, a dynamic or more animated sense of walkthrough inside the building too. So yeah, in a way that it's not, directly uh, relating to the traditional way of building the building, but it's an extracted essence of uh, um, analyzing uh, the, uh, the old uh, area of uh, Odun Pazari. So, I mean, that directly uh, relates to the arriving of the volumes and planning. So I think this is probably the most distinctive part of uh, designing this museum. And uh, you know how it goes, uh, you are all familiar with the design process that once you have a concept that derived from inside to outside, outside to inside, once you have that definition, then it's a matter of discovery by playing the compositions and playing the uh, interlocking of the space. You start to discover uh, really interesting spaces in between and how the, uh, the circulations could be derived by recognizing that organizations. So yeah, that's, uh, uh, that's the most uh, exciting uh, process that uh, we all experience, I'm sure all of you too, through the design process. So the starting point or focus might be unexpected, uh, something that may be, uh, may be uh, different for us and all, but in our case then, recognizing this uh, space quality by seeing uh, the void in between the traditional uh, streetscape or the residential uh, scene was something that uh, we had inspired to. Hmm. Does that make sense? Thank you for your explanation. Mm -hmm. Thank you again. And now, Elida, you can ask your question as well. Hello, uh, I'm an interior architecture student from Bilkent. Uh, so I'm a big fan actually, so thank you for your presentation. Uh, I wanted to ask something about your atrium. So you have an atrium which connects your floors. So did you use any specific acoustical solutions to prevent the voice conversion that an um, atrium would create? Thank you. Sure, yeah, that's a very good point. <laughs> Uh, to be very honest, uh, we didn't uh, come up with the particular solutions or strategy to control the atrium uh, traveling of the noise, mostly because the atrium is not as large uh, and, and it's not an active uh, a space like, uh, um, you know, say like a lecture rooms or uh, the meeting spaces or um, any of that sort. We always thought maybe a um, nice uh, art installation or particular um, night events like playing piano, like uh, what they do during the inaugurations uh, or the opening events uh, of the museum. 
So the noise traveling through one floor to another wasn't a particular concern for us. And the fact that the, uh, the walls uh, compose with the spacing, that means that we have an indentation that disperses uh, the sound naturally, rather than reflecting uh, all the way through. And also that rotations and the, uh, the, the form that would generate over um, the sound uh, that won't echo. Uh, so reverberation wasn't that much of a concern for uh, this. So yeah, uh, there's no particular strategy that we thought of from the beginning, but naturally it wasn't uh, becoming a concern. I hope it's not uh, <laughs> now either. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you again. And Asai, you can ask your question. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Esar Belge. I'm coming from Middle East Tech Film University, and I'm uh, in my last year right now. Uh, we have uh, we have been in Eskişehir in this museum last year with my design group, and needless to say, uh, a magnificent context, both physically and so socially. Uh, but I would like to know uh, what was the main motivation uh, behind designing uh, a structure, a building in Turkey, specifically in Eskişehir. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, we are always really attracted and fascinated by a Turkish uh, country and culture itself. I mean, not to mention the amazing food. <laughs> so that's for sure a part of the motivation. But um, well, uh, the client chose us to, they invited us to design the museum uh, because as uh, we were mentioning before, the owner, Mr. Tavancha, he was born and raised in this uh, city and he has such um, a sense of mission uh, and uh, dedications to contribute to the cultural value of the city. So that's uh, how it all started. And it's true, we never knew about the city uh, of course, yes, I mean, anyway, it's, uh, she's, she's from Turkey, but uh, it's always a pleasure to start to be a, a start of something. Uh, and uh, as Kim Human Associate, we had multiple opportunity to build something away uh, from the very center of the city. Although this SKS is not a small city, it's a big, uh, uh, dynamic, young, uh, active city, so it's not like middle of nowhere. But uh, we sense that in a, in a way that the contemporary architecture or the museum was something that uh, wasn't still starting up. So uh, it was such a pleasure for us to, to become one of the first one. Um, so yeah, it was very motivating from the very beginning. Uh, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you again. And Neil, now you can ask. Um, first of all, thank you very much for this informative conference. It was very valuable. And I was very interested about the interlocked parts in the interior that created its own spaces. And the integrated uh, seating units, they were very far away from like the traditional uh, seating units that we're like seeing in our daily life and what we expect to see like those furnished um, types of seatings and uh, these stared or tiered seatings really drew my attention. Like what was the concept behind them and uh, what was the main goal of doing those seats like that? Thank you very much. You wanna say that, yes? Yeah, sure. Actually, that is um, a part of this whole rotation, uh, the, 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 the tornado that we just described. It is extension and continuation and it also serves for the purpose of connecting the plaza level to the ground floor, which is the beginning of the exhibition journey. So it uh, functions uh, very well and responds mm -hmm. to this um, formal and mm -hmm. functional needs. And we also saw it as an extension of the street extension of the plaza. And it's always more spontaneous, uh, the idea of sitting and just chatting and hanging out on the street rather than, you know, inside the building. So uh, if this gives a halfway uh, feeling of being outside, but still comfort, uh, have this comfort zone inside, uh, and you could take coffee outside or you know, drink it inside. Um, so this uh, uh, breaches or the seating that creates the sense of, uh, you know, still enjoying 
outdoor public spaces. Um, so yeah, uh, this blurred um, boundaries between inside and outside, what makes this stepping down uh, uh, more inviting and spontaneous, um, I suppose, yeah. And as we were uh, saying before, uh, one thing is to achieve the continuity of the street, but also to offer a spontaneous gathering space where people can just come and hang out and read, or to turn it into more like a lecture space and so on. So um, this um, multi-purpose uh, use and activated um, space is something we, we strive to design for. So I hope this the museum will take advantage fully and to have as many different uses as possible. Thank you very much. Mm. Uh, thank you very much for the question and answer. And now we can uh, answer Sarah's question. Hello. I would like to, of course, uh, thank you for this beautiful presentation. It was very nice and uh, as the building is. The last yeah, connection. Yeah. And I would like to ask that. Uh, your... Is this Sorry, okay? can you repeat your question? We had a connection problem, I guess. Okay. Um, I thank you. And uh, I would like to ask that your approach with traditional materials and techniques are uh, apparent in your project. And you implemented and you researched Turkish context and Eskishehir context and implemented some similar techniques um, inspired from them. Um, do you think that Turkish architecture uh, is integrated with its own culture and knowledge, uh, the tradition, as uh, much? Because I'm asking it because uh, Japanese architecture is known by uh, how it's nurtured nurtured by its own um, like rich culture and become uh, globally appreciated and known by that. And how can uh, Turkish architecture also maybe do a similar uh, thing? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, the traditional architecture uh, that uh, I have visited is just breathtaking. Uh, and not to mention any mosques, uh, the timber structured uh, old buildings are just amazingly beautiful. Space quality, the lights are uh, extraordinary. Um, what I found uh, interesting also for these uh, earlier slides that we were showing is a sense of uh, dedicating or connecting to the community uh, on this competitions of starting with the smaller uh, aggregates and then to start elevating to have this uh, almost sacred space inside. It's uh, always quite amazing in the context. I believe it's uh, relating to the culture, perhaps, uh, um, yeah, to the context of this uh, uh, Turkish uh, architecture. Uh, that said, um, what I wasn't sure is how this is, um, this is relating to the contemporary architecture in Turkey which of course in a Japanese um, contemporary architecture, one might say the same. Uh, we would feel the existence of this connection uh, from our traditions uh, to the, the new construction. Many of it, uh, it relates to, you know, the construction company or <coughs> contractor, contractor uh, to choose a faster, a more economic way to dealing with the, uh, you know, buildings. Um, so, yeah, this is uh, perhaps um, questions that we all ask ourselves. Uh, how do we, you know, continue the quality that the traditional architecture has achieved and try our best to still um, carry that uh, essence to uh, contemporary architecture? And I, I believe in, in Turkey, um, when we were going through uh, many streets and construction sites, uh, it's, it, there's a um, certain level of discontinuity uh, of carrying this quality of an architecture. So yeah, that's the kind of short impression that I had. <laughs> Thank you very much. Mm. 
Thank you both. And now we have uh, a question from Ezgi Çırpanlı. Hello, thank you for your uh, presentation. Uh, and uh, I'm Ezgi, senior year student of architecture department and also a member of uh, Design and Architecture Society. And I would like to ask you something about uh, the international projects uh, and its limitations and uh, challenges. Uh, in the field of international projects, in order to create a design that satisfies the needs of the site with its significant culture and enhance the quality of the space with its architectural quality and functions, how do you manage the potentials with challenges and limitations? I know you somehow answered that question, but uh, I want to look at further details of that question as well. Thank you. Oh, you mean in the design process as well as the, the construction process? Um, yeah. Uh, once again, I, I, I would uh, say that uh, it's inevitable that we have many challenges because we all come from a different backgrounds, and especially for an architect uh, like us, uh, um, used to the way things are in Japan. It's rather um, meticulously planned uh, before actually doing things. That's uh, a lot to do with the nature of how we are, the Japanese are, which in certain countries, it's the opposite. Uh, you take action before uh, planning, uh, which could come out as a surprising uh, result or much more unique uh, result. So we always have to balance this uh, you know, planning with the results and actions to the um, yeah to the process. So in this scenario, it was a challenge for us. That uh, but yeah, at the beginning, I had difficulty uh, of uh, um, adapting to the speed of a process um, because we needed to plan so many things simultaneously, and the speed was just um, yeah. Dizziness. <laughs> it made us uh, dizzy to plan in such a speed. But now that I understand that, uh, this um, this is part of the construction culture. And when we understood how it's done normally in Turkey, then uh, I guess the mutual respect and understanding was the key uh, towards the mid uh, um, of the projects. Uh, I don't know, Yasmin, if you want to yeah. <laughs> comment from a <laughs> Turkish viewpoint. <laughs> That's true. If you compare and contrast the Japanese approach in planning, and um, maybe it's the regional, not only Turkish way of not so much planning and figuring things out along the way, because conditions are always changing. So even though you plan, it's usually wasted in our context in the regional, if we speak about uh, Turkey and all the neighbors, Middle East, even Balkans. Uh, so it was a very interesting experiment, uh, mm -hmm. taking best parts of both and trying to mesh them and mm -hmm. uh, create something fast, yet uh, keeping an eye on the details as you would do in a Japanese context. Um, and also, it was a very interesting for us to find out how skillful people on site are, actually. Even without fully describing the whole process, they took lots of initiatives. And if you're on time and work with them, you can really get very nice results. Um, mm. uh, that was an educative process. I would just add on to you kids in such way. Mm. Oh, just one uh, thing that I may add to this. It's not particularly a challenge, but more of an interest. Uh, viewpoints and maybe it relates to the the questions that are earlier uh, been raised uh, this cultural context that are reflected in the quality of the space or the nature of the space is the fact that the sense of security and private a sense of privacy mm. is different in turkey than how we perceive mm. uh, from a european context for instance we do practice in, in france and we do um, build buildings in Denmark, uh, Scandinavia, Switzerland, and so on. But the sense of security, the need of being secured, to be protected, and to uh, and the sense of public space is, is very different in Turkish context. Meaning that uh, you have to have this uh, really good security and sense of uh, being protected. And the public space that are freely open and everybody can access uh, in the Turkish context is not exactly welcomed, like with the open arms. 
So this uh, a way to plan the security and to have a uh, control within the sense of openness. Uh, this was really interesting. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, this was really interesting. Thank you. Hmm. Well, thank you very much again. And we have one more question uh, from uh, Betul, as I assume the name. Yes, yes. Uh, first of all, thank you uh, for your presentation and uh, the contribution uh, in uh, for our city and uh, arts, maybe. Uh, my question will be, are there any relation from a uh, Greek pantheon by uh, design this uh, void, uh, void? I mean, because it uh, provides kind of frame to sky from uh, ground or from up to sky. Uh, I was wondering about that. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> Um, not directly to Greek Pantheon, but I think the holistic aspect of using something immaterial such as light, uh, um, or even I think the, the rest of the visual communication in between floors um, can be taken as a parallel uh, in, in terms of symbolism. Uh, that would be my answer. Of course, there are many things that we can do. <laughs> it's a very good question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you again. And we have also a question from chat. Uh, the question is basically, uh, why did you choose to build a museum in a traditional site rather than building the museum in empty site like Museum Troy? Um, there was a problem with the microphone. So I just uh, asked this or on behalf of him. Uh, well, the site was given to us, so it wasn't really our choice to build in a particular uh, spot. Um, but yeah, uh, that's all I can say, maybe. But uh, at the end, I think results is uh, is something else uh, that to have this museum that derived from the um, traditional context that makes the firmer link from uh, traditions to the newer parts of the um, the urban site. So I believe the site was, uh, um, at the end, uh, quite effective. So like a research ground where we try to collect um, traditional references, mm. go back in the history. Mm. So thank you again. I can ask a question, uh, and I would like to remind that uh, like we're kind of approaching towards the end. So if you have any final questions, um, you can. Uh, raise your hand or write to the chat. So meanwhile, um, I had a question regarding, so um, when the museum was opened in the first uh, three months, uh, over 90,000 people visited the museum and it was, uh, everyone was visiting, it was so popular, it was the agenda. And um, so th that was kind of from the visitor's point of view, but uh, do you have the um, reaction of the local residents of the people or local craftsmen in the uh, close surroundings in the Odum Pazar region or just uh, the uh, surrounding streets? Hmm. <laughs> um, we didn't have the opportunity to be uh, directly connected to uh, the artisans or communities uh, at the end after the museum has opened, but I did receive an email from the neighbors, <laughs> how uh, she enjoyed <laughs> this museum. <laughs> so that was really something. Um, and we do uh, communicate with the people who are spending um, time at the hotel across the museum, which is owned and designed by the same owner. So we come across with these people who are uh, from the neighborhood or maybe from the adjacent cities to visit the Eskeshe and this become part of the attraction. And they seem to enjoy it quite a bit. Um, so yeah, uh, it's been very rewarding. And also we know that the yeah. museum um, foundation and the P 
people in the museum are in close contact with the, the local um, craftsmen or the local values, uh, how to uh, make it into a full package of you know, representation of culture and local values in a way mm -hmm. uh, when they're promoting the city even. So they, um, from food to ceramics to everything, like they are in close contact with local people and they use museum and hotel as a platform to bring them mm -hmm. on stage. Thank you. So I guess we can say it's a positive um, influence on everyone uh, and like um, towards the um, economy and social life of uh, the city. Yeah. And also um, it's interesting because when um, I didn't personally have the opportunity to visit uh, the museum, but when I was looking toward, uh, from the photos taken from the streets or from the Google um, street view, I realized the different um, views captured from like the traditional old houses. And then uh, towards the end of the uh, streets, uh, we see the museum. So it's very unexpected and uh, very interesting. So I believe um, it's pretty um, unexpected and uh, in a positive way for the uh, local people, like after all these years of the same texture. Uh, so now we have a question. And again, there was a microphone problem. So I can uh, read out Elif Nur Ipek's question to you. Um, she's asking, um, was it the same structure and design you designed in your mind at the beginning or did you make changes during construction stage? Uh, well, the original concept uh, was still intact and remained. However, that said, <laughs> we did make many changes during the construction. Uh, well, uh, that was one of the probably uh, biggest advantage of working with the uh, clients as a contractor, that they can, uh, they are willing uh, <laughs> to tackle the changes during the construction because they, they take a full control of what they do and uh, manufacturers and sub-construction company and so on. So when we start to discover a better way of uh, creating the space uh, than originally anticipated, uh, we were lucky and fortunate to make that change. However, I know that the, I gave uh, <laughs> uh, the client's uh, construction leader uh, such a headache <laughs> of uh, adding many things and layers. And yeah, we had a, um, a lot of uh, difficulty <laughs> with one another, but at the end, uh, the sense of achievement was, uh, is really amazing. Thank you again. And Kadir, you can ask your question. Uh, hello. I also would like to thank you for your very nice presentation and time. I wanted to ask if Kango Kuma also had any individual contribution to this project, mm -hmm. and how is the relationship between Kango Kuma and associates, and uh, how does he contribute to the process? Thank mm -hmm. you. Oh, thank you. Uh, yes, we visited the site together with King Okuma, and he was, uh, of course, <laughs> uh, in a, a process of uh, um, uh, thinking of the concepts together. But in this particular project, uh, I, as a, a partner in charge, took a full initiative uh, controlling the design and directing the design. Uh, but in the most of the cases, he is in the center of uh, the whole generation of the creation of the architecture. Uh, and so, well, the office has become quite large. So uh, this uh, first time around and uh, inputs uh, and the interactions with himself um, becomes uh, more and more challenging, but the engagements and commitment remains still the same. Yeah. Are there any questions? Um, you can, can also I, write. Uh, sure, Kadir. <laughs> uh, I also want to ask, because in our uh, analysis part of our studio projects, we only visit the site once or twice. How many times did you visit the site 
to check mm. the context and design on it. Mm. I don't know so many times that we lost count of it. <laughs> 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 every month or sometimes every two weeks, uh, commuting from Paris almost. Thank you. Mm. Are there any questions? Um, you can, can also I, write. Uh, sure, Kadir. <laughs> Uh, I also want to ask, because in our uh, analysis part of our studio projects, we only visit the site once or twice. How many times did you visit the site to check mm. the context and design on it? Mm. I don't know, so many times that we lost count of it. <laughs> 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 every month or sometimes every two weeks. Um, Commuting from Paris almost. Thank you. Um, are there any questions? You can also write, raise your hand or write on the chat. Mm. I believe there are no further questions. Um, so is there anything you would like to add, uh, Miss Yuki and Miss Yasemin? Um, no, it was really nice. Uh, I, I get the sense that this uh, whole lecture is, um, is very well organized, but the most impressively by yourself, like students, than the you know, faculties. Or, and so this is very impressive. And I think this level of motivation is, uh, is, is, is going to contribute uh, to elevate the uh, architecture level for sure uh, for the near future. So I'm looking forward to that. And uh, we'll be so happy if all of you would visit the museum uh, one day or multiple times. <laughs> to, um, to, it would be very interesting to have your feedbacks on how you experience and see the museum uh, from a Turkish viewpoint as well as uh, young architects' uh, viewpoints. That's also um, would be very nice to hear. Yeah. I will uh, add on to Yuki's comment, even though I'm Turkish, I'm, nice. I'm impressed by all of you guys, all the questions and how clear your thread of thoughts and uh, your keen interest in the profession. Um, yeah, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Keep up with the good job. I'm, I'm very happy to, mm. to, to meet you all. Uh, maybe one last thing I would like to add. Uh, to relate back to one of the questions um, someone was asking about how to link tradition back to contemporary or bring back the values. Uh, one thing I actually um, got better at understanding uh, about our cultural or local values was only after I was confronted with many other uh, different cultures and places I've been living abroad for 10 years. It made it actually sharpened my senses towards my own culture to find to get better and better at finding the values in our own context. So maybe uh, what I would say, uh, try to find a, a way of looking at the things that are so abundantly available around you with a different eye and try to get the essence out of it. I think also how Yuki de derives the concept when he was, she was explaining the values that we find out that is already existing in the surrounding context was such a great example that you can use for uh, for your own practice. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. And personally, I would like to say that I have been in the museum a couple of times. I had the chance. Mm. And uh, it was really fascinating for me to see how the tradition and the contemporary um, has been like uh, connected together and in a very harmonic way. So this was actually really amazed me. And uh, generally, uh, thank you everyone one more time for joining us this afternoon. Uh, I would like to say that it was a very joyful and definitely an inspiring seminar. And I believe um, as design students, uh, we have gathered lots of new information and uh, that information that will enhance our perspective and definitely improve our uh, design approaches. And I believe our participants also have the same idea with me. And also, once again, uh, we are very honored to host you here, Ms. Uh, Yuki Kekuchi and to Ms. Yasemi Shahira from Kengo Kamen Associates. And also, as our um, Salam professor said, that it was really uh, nice to host you here as virtually, but in still in weekend. And thank you for your uh, late afternoon also and for this very inspiring presentation again. 
and um, we would be very honored to uh, meet you in person in the following years also. I hope you will have the chance to. And also thank you everyone uh, to our participants to Odunpozer Modern Museum and to everyone uh, that joined us today. Um, is there anything Esin or Asana you would like to add? Uh, well, I can say that it's been a um, wonderful event for me. Uh, I learned so much um, from like um, all the um, questions and answers and your presentations. And uh, we were looking for this event for so long, uh, for this Friday of, uh, evening. So we're just um, so happy to um, have you here. And also we would thank uh, all of our participants uh, joining us today, uh, realizing this event. I mean, we were uh, around 300 people, but uh, more than 500 people reached us. And uh, this was the limit we could entertain today, but uh, maybe we can have uh, more um, events in the future with you. Uh, so I would just say um, thank you for um, all the participants and our architects. Thank you. Likewise, thank you. it's been a pleasure. Also, uh, I agree with my co-coordinators. It's been a very, very great experience for us to uh, host you here and for thank you for the, all the uh, participants. Uh, I am really happy with that and uh, hope to see you in the future again. Um, thank you again for everything. Thank you. I think we can uh, close the session slowly. So. <laughs> <laughs> no one wants you. <laughs> for me, I don't want to. I mean. We can talk for hours and hours. <laughs> and by the way, thank you for your also kind words uh, to our uh, organization. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right, maybe we exit. Then. <laughs> so, <laughs> you can all take a nice evening home. <laughs> thank um, you so much again. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> See you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. 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 Thank